Good evening. Uh, welcome to Community Board 8 Speaks. My name is Dave Rosenstein. I'm a co-chair of our Communications Committee and your host for tonight's show. Tonight we're going to talk about hunger here in our own community, not in the third world. Our guests offer two perspectives on this issue of long-standing concern to this community board. Too many of our neighbors are going hungry, are embarrassed to ask for help, are unaware of what help might be available or where to find it. David Liston is president of the Holy Trinity Neighborhood Center, and it is in that capacity that he joins us tonight. Most Saturday evenings, David can be found at the center on East 88th Street next to the Holy Trinity Church between 1st and 2nd Avenue uh, with his sleeves rolled up in the kitchen supervising a team of volunteers. A couple times I've been one of those uh, who serve a hot meal to 100 or so guests, some homeless, some barely domiciled, and some just struggling through hard times. David is an attorney with the law firm of Lewis, Bach, Kaufman, and Middlemiss, a former assistant DA and presently a commissioner on the city's Civilian Complaint Review Board. David is a former chair of this community board. And he currently co-chairs our Health, Seniors, and Social Services Committee, which deals with issues like this. Uh, joining David tonight is uh, Stephen Grimaldi, Executive Director of the New York Common Pantry, once known as the Yorkville Common Pantry. Stephen's a licensed master social worker. He is now in a PhD program at CUNY's uh, Graduate Center. Stephen was formerly Deputy Executive Director of Urban Pathways, an agency that provides housing for chronically homeless New Yorkers. That's a, a pioneering area of providing homeless first with homes and then dealing with the other issues. Uh, it's a very important uh, initiative. And earlier was shelter director at Lenox Hill Neighborhood Houses Park Avenue uh, Women's Shelter, which many of you know in the community is in the armory. Welcome to you both and thank you for your, for your service. Uh, David Liston, first, how did you get involved in Holy Trinity's uh, dinner program? We serve on the board together. I know how busy you are. What is it about this work, uh, can I call it a ministry, that uh, engages you so deeply? Well, thanks, Dave, for having me on the show. Um, I got involved in the Holy Trinity Neighborhood Center through the Church of the Holy Trinity, um, which is a, a separate entity from the Neighborhood Center. The Neighborhood Center is uh, non-denominational. We offer our services to people regardless of religious beliefs, whether they have their own religious beliefs, no religious beliefs at all. So the services we provide are, are um, provided on a non-denominational basis. But other than that, in many ways, it is a ministry. It's a, um, it's a way to get involved in the life of a very big city that can sometimes be very impersonal. Um, and by getting involved with our neighbors, I at least have found it a way to connect with people in a way that I otherwise might not be able to. It's made the city a smaller place for me, more like a village. And as you said at the beginning of the show, you know, many of our neighbors go hungry, too many of them. And I saw involvement with the Neighborhood Center as a way of trying to, in some small way, meet that need. And that's why I got involved. How does your program's approach uh, to feeding those in need? There are so many people who are hungry. And thankfully, there are so many different organizations, religious, non-religious, community-oriented, who try to help our neighbors in need. Um, that's what we all have in common. How we achieve that goal uh, or try to change it is different from one organization to another. Um, a number of organizations have people line up and they're handed a bag with a sandwich and something to drink and then they're sent on their way. Um, and that's, that's useful. People are hungry and they're going to be glad to have that. Um, what we've tried to do is a bit different and in some ways more challenging, but I think very valuable. Um, our thinking is it isn't just that people are hungry for food, uh, although that's probably the most urgent need. They're hungry for companionship, for fellowship. We don't just feed people, but we actually invite them in. We set the table as if they were at our home. Um, we use silverware plates. We serve salad, dessert, coffee. The meals are prepared for that particular dinner. People are served almost as if they were at a restaurant or at your mm -hmm. home. Um, and we try to create a real sense of community um, and we provide a sense of connection to our guests that um, we wouldn't be able to provide if we just handed out, handed out a sandwich. We certainly have no criteria for eligibility other than you want to walk in and take a seat, you're more than welcome to. We have people who are homeless. We have people who are nearly homeless. We have the working poor more and more all the time. Um, we have young people. 
of all sorts of people, but what they have in common is that they're hungry for food and fellowship, and we open their doors, our doors to them. Your labor expenses are, are obviously covered by the volunteers, but ha what other funding do you have that helps to pay for the, the food, the, the materials that you need? We have been very fortunate. Um, as serious as the problem of hunger is, thankfully a lot of people in our city recognize this problem and want to be a part of the solution. And so our support comes in a couple of different ways. One, as you mentioned, we have volunteers, many of them, although we can always use more. Um, in terms of providing the food, um, we are very fortunate. Uh, a number of organizations um, provide donations. There's a, a three little red hens. It's a wonderful bakery on the Upper East Side. Mm -hmm. uh, the Vinegar Factory. These uh, shops donate fresh, not just leftover or rejected food, but fresh food so that we can help feed our neighbors. Also, um, we buy some of the food, um, and we do so with funds generously donated by our neighbors. We have fundraisers throughout the, years, uh, throughout the year. Um, and throughout the years, we've been fortunate enough at times to receive grants from various not-for-profit organizations, um, as well as, on occasion, um, support from our elected officials who have been able to send money our way to support the work that we do. So the support comes in a variety of ways from a variety of sources, and um, it never seems to be enough, but we're always grateful for all of it. Steve, you've got a, a, a bigger picture as a person who spends full-time uh, in, in this field, and maybe you could first give us an overview of what what the picture of, of need is. Absolutely. First of all, again, thank you uh, for for having me. Well, and you know, I'll give you a, a frame for what we do. The, the Food Bank for New York City says that about 1.4 million New Yorkers rely on soup kitchens and food pantries. Um, the growing problem is New York City. New right York City. 1.4. 1.4 million. If you look at what the areas and the communities that the Yorkville and now the New York Common Pantry have served over um, the last five years, we've seen an incredible increase. I started five and a half years ago there. I served, we served 1.4 million meals at that time. And then since then, we're now going to break the three million meal mark. Mm. Uh, the number of people we served, uh, 295,000 visitors. 39,000 distinct people. When I first started, that number was in the mid-20s. So we're seeing growing numbers of people, um, and our approach during that time has had to change uh, with how we uh, address hunger as an extension of poverty. So what we've done in that time frame is really look at issues of of hunger and food insecurity in relationship to, to poverty and really try to address holistically some of the presenting problems for the people that come to us. So you've expanded your services to, to be a broader-based um, package? Of Absolutely. During that time, uh, again, in the last five years, what we've done is we've, we've become a, a site, a single-stop, a single-stop um, site, so Single Stop USA, which is a, a large uh, uh, funder, um, has uh, provided uh, funds for us to be able to provide a very, very rich um, array of social services, uh, resources and benefits, uh, tax assistance for individuals, again, finding ways to, um, as one of our uh, supporters likes to refer to it, leaving no funds on the table for every individual that comes to us, we try to maximize their, their resources. And of course, that first starts with, um, pardon the pun, but the, the entree is the food. Um, and it is, it, is, it is in and of itself uh, a service, uh, clearly, um, for the hot meal program that we provide for homeless people last year, uh, about 75,000 meals, including our brown bag program. We'll talk more about that. And our food pantry, which is our largest program, and obviously part of our name and something that we're very much known for, but that is providing a lot of fresh food, including food access um, from farmers, from uh, New York State farms. And we purchase that food. We also combine it, uh, like David uh, at Holy Trinity, with donated food. And then uh, we, we uh, make sure we're, we're meeting nutrition requirements, et cetera. The food is, is clearly something very, very important, providing fresh food. It's also the, some of the most expensive food. It's nutritious food. It's whole food. It, you know, so people have a lot of choices. It's a choice 
model pantry. So it allows people to, to choose and select um, the food across five categories. But at the same time, then we engage them and screen everyone for resources and tell them how we can help them in other ways. And the name change from Yorkville Common Pantry to New York Common Pantry reflects what the increase in services or an increase in the catchment area that, that you serve? I should probably mention that uh, the Yorkville Common Pantry started 1979-1980. It was a joint effort um, from the faith community, churches and synagogues housed at Holy Trinity Church um, as our first home. And uh, we are, are very, very proud of that. And a lot of many of our connections, um, we have about 30 community-based organizations um, and or churches and synagogues that still from that are on in CB8 that are supporters or, or partners in, um, f of ours and very, very um, important partners and uh, including some within our board structure called sponsoring organizations. But that is continues to be part of, of who we are. But more and more people were coming from a variety of different places. And one of the things that needs to be said is that in the last five years, 25% of emergency food programs close their doors. They basically shut down. When you do that, there's, got, there's a void. And who fills those gaps? The larger providers. And luckily, we've been in a position to be able to, to provide um, services and, and uh, take in many of those individuals that were uh, unable to go to their uh, community-based providers. Many of those are, are not only um, in, in uh, Manhattan, but sometimes outside of Manhattan. That's a big uh, drop. Were, were they primarily based in churches and synagogues, or was it the whole range of uh, non-governmental? Well, according groups? to the food bank, again, the food bank uh, is the one that that uh, cited this study, and, and they, or actually they they did this study, and what they were saying is that many, because so much of the food is donated and so much of the labor of volunteers, that a lot of that is very difficult to sustain. Um, I'm sure David can speak to that, how difficult that is to, to, mm -hmm. to sustain a, a volunteer-based organization. Um, but I think, um, and thank goodness, because I think it shows what, what a great uh, you know, service you're providing and what great support of the congregation of the community. But not all communities can be able to do that, especially in some of the, uh, um, the outer boroughs. So those programs, we used to refer people back to their communities because we had a very good, strong referral mechanism called our 24-7 program. Well, 24-7 was, in fact, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and anyone that would come would get emergency food, and then we'd, come, we would refer them back to their communities. What we found was we were referring back to their communities to programs if we had these wonderful, elaborate lists, and those phones were ringing, mm -hmm. no one was there anymore, um, and they basically have run out of food, or they just stop operation. In many cases, even if they've stayed open, they've reduced their services or circumscribed eligibility. So it's been very difficult for people in the last few years to, to get services. You had mentioned when we spoke that you don't serve or, or receive referrals from all of the potential referral sources in the community board simply because of y your own limits of, of staff. You could do more could, if you had. What do you need? We partner with other emergency food programs, sometimes very, very small, and based in Manhattan. And what we do is we allow them, they may not have the ability um, or the staff to screen and help people access other resources. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, program formerly known as, as food stamps, is very important to keeping uh, people out of poverty and to addressing um, hunger and food insecurity. So that program, a lot of uh, these emergency food programs recognize how important that program is, but many of them don't have the staffing, they may not have the expertise, they just may not have the time um, to be able to do it. So what we act as a partner with those, or, emer those organizations, they can screen people for us if they have that ability, or pre-screen, or they can just give out a flyer and direct them to us. But what we do, most importantly with those providers, that we could do more within CBA to get to your specific point and do with all organizations, but again, more in, commu in, in uh, Community Board 8, is we have the ability to allow other organizations to use our scheduler and our calendar to go right in, we send you a link, and then you can put people right into a calendar for a case manager who has a name, you don't have to wait for that phone, someone to pick up the phone, you can open up a calendar and see, oh, there's a slot at 11 o'clock to get a screen for SNAP. Let me put that person in right here. John Smith is in, John Smith, you've got a program, 
uh, you've got an appointment and they can go. You don't need to call, you don't need to confirm or verify. That person will go and that case manager will be there to meet with that person and then follow up with services. The issue of having insufficient resources, we, would, we need more resources for case management because to really help someone after you apply for those resources, you need to confirm benefits and you need to make sure you follow up with that individual mm -hmm. because once we get that person those resources, we really need to make sure we, we follow them. And eventually um, what happens is um, many people that stabilize and they, they, they become self-sustaining and we don't need to do that, but there's a whole new wave of folks every year, 20 to 25 percent increase of folks. Many people move off. And new people come. So we need that constant. So it's really the case management support that I was referring to that would be wonderful to really better link um, some of the providers in CBA. What's the caseload of a, a case manager? Well, what's great about the way we do case management, it's very resource-based case management. So we don't have to do intensive case management. We don't have to um, engage someone um, in, a, in a way where, it, unless they have real psychiatric or, or issues around substance abuse or other things, for the vast majority of people that come to us, they're just poor. They, they need assistance. They're not able to sustain themselves. They're underemployed. Um, they may be unemployed. They may be working part-time. They may even be working full-time and not making enough. So what we're able to do is then engage them, connect them to services, connect them to resources, and move forward. So, you know, you could have a caseload of uh, two, three hundred people, but at the end, with that, uh, but there may be only three, uh, may, maybe three percent to five percent of those folks will need much more intensive services. So you're saying one additional caseworker could add two or three hundred uh, clients? Easy, absolutely. I hope some of our elected officials or their representatives are listening because uh, it sounds like money uh, would be well spent. I guess I'm, I'd ask you both, have you seen a change in, or in the type of person coming looking for, for help? We used to serve maybe 50 people, now we serve 125 or more people. So the sheer volume is higher. But the group is much more diverse, I think, than it used to be. Um, there's certainly a lot of people suffering from mental health issues that aren't getting the treatment that they need. I think that's been going on for a long time. W what I'm seeing is more and more people who don't apparently have a mental health issue. What they have is a job issue. They have a housing issue. They have an economy issue. They're otherwise fine and ready and willing and able to do a lot of things in life. Um, we're also seeing people who have apartments and have jobs but are struggling to pay the rent so they come to the neighborhood supper because that helps them eat while saving desperately needed money for other things. Um, and I'm also seeing, we're seeing uh, a greater range in terms of the age. Many more older people but also more younger people and sometimes children and sometimes families with children. Mm. Are your volunteers changing as well? Are they older, younger, more or less? Is it harder to recruit people? Are they more me-oriented because they're struggling with their own economic challenges? As the economy has gotten worse through the years and as people have suffered more and worried more about their jobs, their housing, their own careers, it's helped them connect with their neighbors in a way that they might not otherwise have. I think sometimes we look at our homeless neighbors and think, actually that could be me one day or it could be someone I know. Whereas I think a few years ago we might have all thought that's them and we're here um, and we'll do our bit, but there's no other connection here. I think there's more of a sense of connection. Um, I also think, and this is a, something I'm very happy about, when the Neighborhood Center began the supper many years ago, um, the volunteers were primarily from the church. Um, thankfully the church is very much a part of the, the volunteer base but we have people from all around the community, more people from outside the church than in. We have people from other faiths. We have Muslim, the group called Muslims Against Hunger that are very active in our volunteer group. We have people from other temples, uh, community organizations. I think the, the, the diversity of our volunteers is our strength, and it's why we've been able to keep up with mounting need by providing more volunteers. Again, we're always open for more, though. How about the bigger picture? Uh, I, what, is there a change in the demographics of, of people who are needing these services? Well, absolutely. I, I keep going back to, you know, give you a five-year uh, span. When I first began, uh, children were about 9% of our population, and now they represent 22%. Wow. 
Um, so that's striking. Certainly the number of people who are, you know, this expression playing by the rules, you know, where everyone, people are working, seeking work, trying to find work. And if you just look at what the minimum wage pays, if you look at what the federal poverty level is, it is grossly inadequate um, to really describe what it is to make ends meet in this city. And people are working and they're just not able to pay their bills. They're doing what I call, you know, expense triage. They're figuring out a way each month to figure out which bill they're going to pay. So is it going to be utilities this? Is it going to, am I going to I have to pay the rent? I can only pay the rent. Uh, you know, I can, I can get away with not paying this month, but I have to pay the other bill. Well, that's unfair. Um, you know, no one should have to do that, especially if, the, if they're uh, working. Uh, so we try to help them bridge those gaps, but that's what we're seeing. I see in that increase. I also see, um, you know, unfortunately, people on fixed incomes, disabled uh, seniors, a big part of what we see. It's not just the senior centers that are seeing it. It's also emergency food and supplemental food programs. So that, that continues to grow, albeit not as uh, quickly as the children. Um, um, but it is growing uh, as well. And to get to your earlier point, and I totally agree with what uh, David was saying about, I, I do believe the economy has fostered um, a real sense of um, compassion and understanding for people. We have uh, grown, our volunteer base has grown, and it is people from all walks of life, um, young and old, and we've seen a, a, a much larger increase each year in younger volunteers coming. And it's actually 45% of, of our labor hours are performed by volunteers. It's something like 40,000 hours, or well, at least that's what it was last year. It'll roughly be the same this year. So it is, uh, it's incredible that, and without that, we couldn't do it because, uh, you know, you figure 40,000 hours, that's running the pantry, that's fulfilling the orders, that's sitting with, uh, with pantry members taking orders, that's then packing the bags, that's the unloading the trucks, it's working in the hot meal program, it's working in our culinary program, we're working in, the li in our nutrition education. The volunteers are everywhere, and without them, we would not be able to do it. You mentioned that you have um, some resources to help people apply for, for benefits. Uh, I was trained as a, um, a substance abuse counselor, and I've talked with people who were very, very intimidated by the HRA system. Um, it, to hear them tell it, they're treated as assuming to be undeserving until they prove otherwise. And they treat the application for food stamps as aggressively and as, as distrustfully as they do an application for home relief, which is, scares people away or those psychiatrically frail or just overwhelmed and, 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 and give up. Uh, but you have a, another way. Uh, tell us about it. Absolutely. So what you're referring to is that we are uh, what's called a pause site. It's the paperless office system. So what this allows people to do is when they come to the New York Common Pantry, they are able to apply for supplemental nutrition assistance program, again, formerly known as food stamps, um, health, health benefits, and tax assistance. They can do this. Uh, well, the tax assistance will refer them um, on site to that. But for those first two programs, we will help them apply right from our program. So because we're a paperless office system, they don't need to go to HRA. Uh, so what you're referring to is this age-old age uh, perspective that goes back to, back to Victorian poor laws about the worthy versus the unworthy poor. And, um, and many people believe that that's infused in our um, in benefits uh, process. And, and it's still to this day that it's, it's part of what it, people experience is why they experience that is because people are being uh, treated unfairly or treated as unworthy of receiving these resources. So we don't take that approach. We treat people with dignity. Um, and uh, when they come to us, they can apply right on site. And then uh, we can connect them to those, to those resources so they don't have to go through that process to go to an HRA office where you hear many stories of people waiting four, five, six, seven hours. And we've actually sent interns, social work interns, to go there without naming who they are. And, uh, and they share stories about how people are treated. They talk about the weight. Um, they get uh, asked about who they are and why they're there so they can figure out um, 
how, what kind of service the individual they're with is going to get, or at least that's their assumption. Um, that's their presumption. So, uh, yes, yeah, so this is one of the reasons why we like this with this system because it definitely allows people to come and then feel as though um, they're going to get treated quickly. We tell them when they call on the phone what they need to bring to them, so they don't have to come back multiple times. Um, and so we really try to make sure that uh, that they have all the 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 pieces for for success. Before we, we run out of time, I want to make sure that we, we give listeners how volunteers can reach you. We have a website. It's htnc.org. And on that website, you'll see many photographs of very happy people volunteering. You'll see the joy on their faces. Um, a picture's worth a thousand words, and I think people will see and be reminded why this is such an opportunity to to give and to get something in return. For the uh, volunteers for the pantry? Uh, likewise, you can go to uh, nycommonpantry.org. Uh, you can uh, click the um, How Can I Get Involved button on the website. You can also just email Jen Winter, who's our direct um, development associate for volunteers. It's J Winter, like the season, at nycommonpantry.org. And again, our, our website is nycommonpantry.org. And for those people who don't want to type all that in, we've still got the domain ycp.org if that's easier for you. But uh, either way, you can go and you can see there's, there are volunteer opportunities in the morning, in the evenings, through the day, and on the weekends. We're open seven days a week. You mentioned you, you, there were a couple of, of gaps in the system that, that struck you as being notable. And one, I think, was the breakfast issue. When the pantry decided to figure out what, when we were figuring out what hot meal programs we were going to, to run and operate, we looked at what was out there. And at the time, breakfast was a notable oversight, that there were some lunch programs, mm -hmm. there were many dinner programs, but there were not many breakfast programs. This is one of the reasons why we developed breakfast five days a week. If you look at it, there is not a, as far as I can tell, except for senior centers, there is not a single breakfast program in CB8, as far as I can tell. Um, St. Bart's is on 51st Street. That's the other breakfast program that I know of besides us. And so many people come from CB8 to our program, but for some it's got to be a little bit of a, of, a, of a distance to come, I imagine. So I think that that's a gap that would be wonderful to, to see. I also think one of the big gaps still remains that we could better connect with those programs so they could link people for more comprehensive services other than food. Services other than food is what we refer to it in, internally. Um, so there are many services other than food that those providers in CB8 could be linking people to that we could help folks so they can get their food perhaps in there very, very locally, but that those other services that we could connect people to. Again, that schedule and that calendar I think would go a long way. I hope some of our viewers uh, were able to get some good information and maybe we could do some good by uh, talking about this and I thank you both so much for making the time to come here tonight. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. And for having thank us. you for listening.